Excellent. So thank you once again, everyone, for joining at this time, wherever you may find yourself in the world. I'm excited to be here with you. I'm uh, coming at you all the way from Seattle, Washington, and it is a gloomy day outside. It has been sunny for the for the most part during the week, and now it's gloomy. It's kind of what, what it is always here, which I don't really appreciate because I like the sun a lot. Uh, I heard some of you are from Africa, from Nigeria. Love Africa. I've been there uh, three times. I've done three tours to Africa, and I love it. I've been to Kenya. I've been to South Africa, I've been to Swaziland, I've been to Morocco, uh, just wonderful places in the world and I, I really love it. Um, I know some of you are also uh, coming in from India, most of you. Welcome to the session. I love um, I, the idea of going to India. In fact, I was supposed to be there uh, in March, this March, and I'm really sorry I didn't get to go. Um, it was really one of my dreams to go. Actually, last year I was supposed to go as well, and we had some visa issues. So it just hasn't happened for me, but I hope it happens after all of this uh, is done. Again, I am screening the chat, so please, please use the chat to go ahead and ask the questions as I go. This session really is truly about you, about who you are, and about where you come from. And a lot of times we think that we have to have this really extraordinary story to tell so that we can stand out, right? We have to be super. Uh, and the reality, you don't. The reality is that you don't. I'm not. I'm very ordinary. I'm very normal. I fail a lot. Uh, I have imposter syndrome all day long. And in fact, um, I didn't even understand what branding was um, when I first started. Nobody, nobody told me I didn't have a coach. Um, now I have six or more. I have a lot of coaches and I just didn't know. I started my career um, very early in my life. I was 16 years old. I came to this country when I was 13 from Venezuela, from the slums of Venezuela, and I had to learn language. I also had to learn everything. I mean, my parents are, are very old school, so they didn't want to Americanize themselves. And so they didn't teach me the ropes of becoming American or Americanized, or even living the American dream. And so for me, uh, finding these things were, you know, happened very painfully. I just kind of have to stumble across those things. But one of the things that I learned quickly as I began my journey of personal branding is that there's some key elements. If you may please mute yourselves as you come into the call, thank you. Um, there are some key elements to branding. Um, there's mission, attributes, character, a story, of course, and then your search engine optimization, how people find you, what people see about you. And I started my personal branding journey back in August 2012. This is actually my first uh, profile picture at Microsoft when I joined in August 2012, almost eight years ago. And I came in, took my profile photo for my for my badge, and uh, I had a hard time my first, my first year at Microsoft. I had a hard time. I actually had a really that time. I was being bullied by four women at Microsoft when I first arrived. I came into the Fort Lauderdale office, which is uh, the Latin America headquarters, and I was really excited to start at Microsoft, and then I was not excited anymore. And I almost left after a year of bullying. I took it for a long time. I thought it was me. I thought it was culture shock. I thought it was so many other things. I had imposter syndrome the whole time. And um, after a year, I was like, okay, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I, this is too much. And I remember the day that I came in and I had one of these ladies do something to me. And I grabbed my laptop and I was like, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm walking out. And I, and I started to walk out. And a broker manager uh, that sat next to me grabbed my arm and he goes, you're not going anywhere. You need to stay here. And I was like, I don't need to stay here. And he's like, yes, you do. People need you. You need to stay here. Microsoft needs you. And so I went home. I was very upset that day. I didn't quit, which I was going to, but I didn't. And I went home to think, well, what if I stayed? Why would I stay? What's my why? I don't even have a why. In fact, I had not even stopped to think about my why. I had nothing going on for me except, I, you know, it was like an unintentional career. I was just kind of going through life. And if I had an opportunity, I'd take it. If I did this, I'd do it. I was searching. I just didn't have purpose. And I learned that without purpose, I also didn't have uh, an intentional brand of attributes. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how people saw me. I didn't know what I made people feel. I, I Sometimes I was kind, sometimes I was not, sometimes I was sarcastic, sometimes I was, it was just not a mix of attributes of myself that I had not intentionally aligned to my purpose because I had no purpose, right? I had no character definition. I didn't know who I was in my own uh, life story. I didn't know who my parents were or my sisters or my mentors. I didn't even have mentors. I didn't know my character definition. 
my purpose, my attributes, my character definition, I didn't even have a story. Actually, I had a story, but I didn't know how to put it together to actually tell the story. I didn't know what parts of my story were important enough to tell, were good enough to tell. Would people listen to my story? Why would they care to my story of, about my story? If you Googled me at that time, you would only find my address because it's public record. That's all you would find. And you would find my parents' address too. So at that moment when I went home, um, before I quit Microsoft, I, which I didn't, I went home and I started thinking about this. If I stayed at Microsoft, why would I stay? What would be my purpose? And that compelled me to start building my brand with no advice from anyone, no advice. And I created this mission for myself. This is exactly the same statement that I created eight years ago. I am blank and blank because the world needs blank. If you may please unmute yourself. I mean, mute yourself, sorry. Mute yourself, your mics, thank you. In order to blank, I created this mission for myself. I said, I have to have a mission. I have to know why I'm gonna stay at Microsoft. I have to know who I am, who I want to be. And so I began to think about this statement and this is what I want to share with you. It's a simple statement. This is what I want you to start with, okay? What is your brand mission? Every brand has a mission. If you do marketing, if you study marketing and communications, you'll know that every brand, every corporate brand that exists has a mission, has a, has a brand mission. Well, you do too. You are an entity and you have, you have to have a mission. What does your brand stand for? What is the purpose? Who does it serve and why? Now, I get it. I get it. The world's a big place. I probably don't reach, you know, eight billion people in the world. I don't intend to either. I have a very targeted audience, just like every brand has a targeted audience. So it's really important when you think about people that you appreciate their brand, they actually have a very targeted, very niche audience. The Oprah's of the world, the Tony Robbins of the world, the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos, they have a specific audience that they target and they talk to and they appeal to. And then everyone else, is, it's fluff. It's the rest of it. It's, it's, it's extra. But the actual audience is really important. And for me, I began to think about my audience. I said, you know, if I stay at Microsoft, if I build my career here, despite the bullying, I'm not going to stop it. These women are going to stay, still do this to me. If I decide to come back tomorrow and I decide that I want to, why would I do it? And my audience became younger women in tech that, like me, were probably getting bullied too. But nobody was talking about it. Nobody talked about it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to let them know that it's okay, that we're all in this together. We're only 2% of the entire uh, industry, and we're getting bullied by other women? That's terrible. Let's talk about it. Who else is getting bullied? And so I became, to, I started to target younger women in tech early in career, uh, typically ages 22, at the time I was 30, so 22 to 24. Uh, and I was young enough to kind of be, you know, connected to them, uh, but also I had been a little bit more into the career path and so I could I can advise them I can mentor them so when you think about your purpose brand mission the first thing you think about is your audience the first thing you think about is who can I target who how can my story serve someone could it be other women could it be other men could it be younger audiences could it be older audiences could it be IT pros could it be you know find a niche find a niche that you want to tune into. You probably are not that right now. I wasn't a mentor at the time. I was nobody at the time. I didn't have a purpose, like I said, but I targeted myself and that began my journey of brand story. So this is the mission statement and we're going to, we're going to go out with this. I hope you have this in mind. The next thing I thought about was, okay, what am I today? Right? I was nobody. I didn't even know my attributes. So I needed a baseline. I needed to say, okay, I don't even know where I start. I don't know how people see me. Branding is not how, what you say you are. It's how you make people feel and what they say about you when you leave the room. When people come in contact with my brand, with Miri, they should not be surprised at the things that I've done online, at the things that I can give you in person. I am the same person. I should be the same person. Offline and online, it should be congruent. It should be consistent. But I didn't know how to put that together. In fact, I didn't know how, which, what I was. So I decided to do something, which I'm going to give you as homework today. Write this down. You're going to ask people one open-ended question. People that you trust, because I made a mistake. I didn't know nobody was guiding me. I'll tell you about that in a minute. 
You can ask people, how do I show up? That's it. You can use really great technology that exists today. It didn't exist back then to me. Um, you can use anonymous surveys. You could obviously send an email and say, hey, I have a question. I took this class on personal branding and I need to know my baseline. So can you answer the question? How do I show up? And people are going to answer the question. <laughs> people are going to be really candid with you if, you if you let them, okay? Don't tell them how to answer the question. So people are going to be like, oh, do I give you bullets? Do I give you a story? You say, hey, however you want. Answer the question however you want. How do I show up? Now, I did this when I did it. I knew no better, right? I didn't have guidance. So I asked everybody. And I found real quick, I had a lot of haters, a lot of haters. People were telling me really mean things when I asked them this question, right? They were just waiting for the opportunity to tell me how unaware I was. And perhaps I was unaware, but they could have said it kindly. So what I recommend is when you ask people this question, ask people that you trust, ask people that you know want to see you win. There's a lot of people, a lot of people out there that don't want to see you win. In fact, I would recommend don't share your dream, your personal dream as you start this journey with everyone because not everyone wants to see you win. Get some people that are your tribe, get some people that are trusted, get some people that can give you advice that do want to see you win. So those are the people that you're going to ask, hey, how do I show up? And they're going to give you a lot of answers. Now, when you get those answers, you're going to get a lot of attributes, personal attributes. For me at the time, I got a lot of things. Miri, you're loud. Miri, you're gregarious. Miri, you're funny. Miri, you're sarcastic. Miri, you're this. Miri, you're that. Everybody had an opinion about who I was. Everyone had an opinion, right? And so I had to decide at the moment. I was like, okay, this is my baseline. Where do I go from here? Where I went from there was thinking about my audience, my target audience. If I was going to target younger women in tech early in career, uh, one of the things that came up was sarcastic. That was one of the words. And so I was like, ah, sarcastic may not work, you know, for those women. Those women are, um, they're sensible, they're sensitive. Sarcasm seems authoritative to them. In fact, even more, I want to be global. I want to reach people in India. I want to reach people in Africa. And so sarcasm doesn't work in Africa or India. That's a very American thing. So I had to dial down the attributes that were coming up as, as patterns that were not attained to or popular to, or they were not appealing to the audience that I was targeting. That's why targeting an audience is very important because we're going, you're going to brand yourself according to that target audience. Is this making sense to everyone? I hope it is. So the first thing that showed up was sarcasm. And I was like, ah, I need to change that. The other one that came up and I'm checking the chat here. Um, the only one, the other one that came up was, um, was feminist. Hey, Miri, you're very feminist. And I was like, of course I am. Duh, of course I'm feminist. Why am I feminist? I was born in slums. I had to hustle my whole life. I have two sisters. We were very, very poor, right? We had to, we had to survive. So, you know, my mom taught me to be tough. No man needs to be opening my door. No man needs to be giving me any gifts. I can buy my own gifts. I'm going to build my own career, right? So I became a hardcore feminist. But then something happened. I got married. I had two sons. And I wanted to teach them to open the doors for girls. And I wanted my husband to buy me gifts. So I realized also that younger women in tech were finding themselves in a precarious situation about who they were. Hey, if I look and I look powerful as a woman, does that make me, you know, independent to the point where I can't have relationships that serve me? By all means, no. We are a community. We serve each other. We are meant to be relational. We're seeing today how important that is in our lives. So I decided to dial down feminism because in, especially here in the Western world, it's a very, um, it's a very, you have to tread lightly with this word because it can be construed as extremism. And I did not want to be attached to extremism. So I changed sarcasm and feminism to kind and feminine. And I became kind and feminine. Those were my aspiring attributes. I wasn't that right away. That was my baseline. I was not that, but I was going to work toward becoming that for the sake of my audience. So thing number one for you, the first thing you got to do is think about your audience and then based on that audience, get your homework out of the way, ask people, how do you show up? And those patterns are going to come up, create the data, create the data, look at the data, data, see those patterns, see those outliers, and you're going to see what people think about you. That's your brand right now. 
And now you're going to take that brand that is right now unintentional and you're going to make it intentional. You're going to go, okay, with this, I'm going to switch it. I'm going to mold it. I'm going to polish it. I'm going to make it better. And I'm going to create overarching ad ad um, attributes that make up who I am. Now you're going to ask me, hey, Miri, why just two attributes? You can have 10, you can have 20. For me, it was just easier back then to think of two because with two, I can remember every five minutes, it, almost, it acts as a temperature gauge of my brand. Hey, is my email kind and feminine? Do I dress kind and feminine? Do I show up online kind and feminine, right? And I don't share this with people outside, right? I don't go around telling people, hey, I'm kind and feminine, but hopefully you've seen me online or you've connected with me and those attributes come up in a certain way because that is what I try to be consistently, right? So that is the first piece. It's I am blank and blank. Construct your attributes intentionally. Don't just go around life be like, oh, people think I'm this and that's it. No, people will think what you tell them to think. People will attain to what you want to show up like. You have control over that, okay? You have control over that. So, purpose. Hi, Jen. Yes, I'm glad it's making sense. Again, I'm, I'm watching the chat, so please feel free to uh, ask questions, and if it's not clear, let me know. The next two things are really exciting. So once you've defined your, your audience and you define your attributes and you said, okay, my baseline, where do you go from there? Well, you have to build out the world and in order to. This builds your mission. Now you have a purpose, right? You have an audience, you have some attributes, you're gonna create this character that's gonna go do something in the world. You're creating your own character, that's your brand. And for me, I didn't know it back then. Again, I didn't have anybody telling me this, but I, I started doing social media at Microsoft. I actually moved roles uh, after that terrible year. Uh, somebody told me about this role. And by the way, when I applied to the role, here at Microsoft, um, typically you have an informational with the hiring manager. My hiring manager was here in Seattle. I was in Florida, so I didn't know anybody. Typically, a lot of people know that when you have when you go get a job, it's people who it's who you know, right? It's who you know. So if you don't know somebody, then you're not gonna get it. Well, that's not true. Okay, if you brand yourself well, people know you instead of it's who you know. It's they know you because you branded yourself. And people want to work with people they see that they're active in the community, that they're doing things. I have had multiple offers for jobs consistently because people find me. In fact, the last few three jobs I've had, people have found me. I have not had to find a job. Okay. So that idea of like, it's who you know, no, it's who knows you. It's who knows you. So you have to position yourself so people get to know you. And we have the channels today. We have the technology to do that. I didn't have that back then. Okay. So here it is. The world needs, the world's a big place. We're going to talk about that in a minute. In order to, how did I do this? Magic storytelling. Back then I took a role. Um, and like I said, my, my hiring manager was here in Seattle. I had no idea who he was, never met him in my life. I was like, I'm not going to get this job. Right? So what I did was I went and talked to the person who was leaving the job. She was in Fort Lauderdale. I went and talked to her and I said, Hey, I know that you're leaving this job. I want to have an information with the hiring manager. I want to get more information. And she goes, don't bother. We already have somebody for that role. Don't even bother to apply. And I was like, Oh, you mean apply? I will. So I applied and I got. It. Now, I applied to a role that I did not know anything about. It was social media. I was getting okay on social media. I had a Twitter account around 2009. So I had been on Twitter for about three years. That's it. I wasn't on Facebook. I wasn't on Instagram. My only channel was Twitter. And so when they asked me, why did you apply? They actually got the interview. And when they asked me, hey, why did you apply to this role? You haven't done social media for corporate yet. And I'm like, well, who has? Social media is relatively new. If somebody's telling you they're a guru, they're probably lying. I'm not going to tell you I'm a guru. I'm going to tell you I know enough to be dangerous and I'm going to learn the rest. If you let me learn, I'll learn the rest. And I got the job. So one thing you need to learn, one hack, is people don't hire you on your experience only. They hire you on your potential. And how you sell that potential is very important. In fact, the next job I got was the storyteller. That didn't exist as a job before. I didn't go to school to be a storyteller. I didn't go to school to go to social media. I, I, we don't have these things back then. In fact, a lot of jobs that you are gonna, you're going to have in the future don't exist today. How you pivot yourself, how you position yourself for those jobs is what's important. It's the potential that you will have. I'm going to make a little pivot here as well for women, a plug-in for women specifically. Women, did you know that we, the way that we apply to jobs is this. Let's see my qualification. Oh, I have to have this, 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 this. Oh, I have four out of five. I'm not going to apply. I only have four out of five. I only check four boxes. 
this is what men do. This is true, okay? I know this for sure. Oh, wow, we have to have this, 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 this. I only have three, but you know what? I'm going to apply anyway, and hopefully they'll hire me. And they do, because they applied. So most jobs, first of all, the job description is BS, right? It's, it's just fluff, because they're trying to get someone, they're trying to put this together to understand a job. Once you get there, you hopefully know you'll know that it's not exactly what the job description was anyway. They want to see potential. They want to see, clearly they want to see a path, but they also want to see potential. How you position yourself in the work in the workplace, how you position yourself in digital, how you position your your thought leadership will speak for you at these moments. So, storytelling will do that for you. We're going to get into storytelling. I hope you're ready. Here's what happens with your story. I'm I asked you guys to grab some pen and uh, paper. So hopefully you have, and I'm going to help you. You're going to grab your pen and paper. We're going to create your origin story right now. Are you ready? Pen and pepper. Let me see it. Hopefully. Raise your hands. Okay, cool. So your story, your origin story is going to look a little bit like this. You're going to have a blank sheet of paper, just like my, my, uh, my deck here, my slide. And you're going to start at the moment that you were born. Now, maybe it's a high, maybe it's a low, maybe it's a flat line. You could start real high, be like, hey, when I was born, it was the best day on earth, right? Because I was born. Start there. So people are going to start like, oh, I was born. It was really low for me. Eh, it was OK. I was born right after my sister, Ellie, my older sister. I'm the middle child. And I was I was the surprise baby. My mom actually didn't want to have me because they were like, like I said, we were poor. And so having one baby and then she literally like 18 months, she had another one. She was not really happy about having me. And so my birth was kind of inconsequential. Nobody really cared. Um, the doctors were actually on strike that day. My mom had no milk, so she had a lady feed me. It was just kind of a horrific birth anyway. So I think of it as like, yeah, it's not a high, not a low, whatever. Um, I started there. And, and what you're going to do is you're going to put, I hope you're doing the same. You're putting a little dot, putting your birthday there, uh, the day you were born. And the next point is the next uh, memory that you have that is significant in your life. Good or bad. Nobody's looking at this. You're the only one. So you can go from there and do a higher low. My next low was actually my little sister being born because then she, you know, she took my place. Now I'm the middle child. That's not a good thing. Nobody wants to be a middle child. Um, it's inconsequential. It's like, you know, they love the, the oldest. She's, the, you know, she's always spoiled. The little one's always spoiled. I'm in the middle, like, yeah, this sucks. So I really wasn't too happy my little sister was born. In fact, we don't even get along anyway today. It's funny. Um, so we've always had a family feud. So, yeah, hello. Um, then I actually, we were able to move to the city. We were living in the slums. My mom worked for a long time, my dad worked, and they moved us out of the slums into the city. So that was a really big high. I remember I was six years old. We moved into an apartment, a really tiny apartment, tiny apartment that my aunt, uh, who was my, my dad's older sister, um, she had been in, in the industry for a while. She was a professional and she bought this little apartment. So she get, she gave it to us, uh, not gave, she sold it to us at a very cheap place. So we were able to move out of the slums. Um, then let's see, I, um, oh, I moved to the US, 1992. It was a true low. I did not want to come here. I did not like this country. Uh, I was really happy in Venezuela. I was in my teens. I was 13. So I started to have my friends. I was getting into, you know, I was soon to go to high school. My life was starting as a teenager, and now it is completely disrupted to come here. Um, we landed in Miami. My, my dad was very strict, and he was like, we are in America, but we're not ever going to be Americans. And I was like, what does that even mean? Right. So it was just not a fun transition for us uh, to come to the United States. It took me a while, in fact, to get accustomed to the country and to learn the language. And I just did not have a good time coming. Of course, later I loved it and I love this country now and I became a citizen. But that was a low in my life at that time. Um, 96, I graduated. Some of you were born in 96 or even later. Don't even talk to me right now. Um, yeah, graduated high school and with scholarship, all of us, my sisters, all three of us had to earn scholarships to go to university because clearly my parents couldn't afford it. So it was a good time. Life was good. I had friends. My life was kind of getting started. And I actually got married two years later. That's equally high. Um, so I've been married. It's going to be 22 years this October, if you can't believe that. 
So here you see a little pattern of highs and lows, peaks and valleys, some flats. Um, this is what I want you to do uh, as you begin to build what I call, call your origin story. This is all going to help your branding, okay? So build your peaks, build your, uh, build your valleys, all these memories. Uh, if you want to take this offline and continue it later, do it by all means, do a whole lot. I'm only giving you an example of what this typically will look like. The one that I really have in my office, it's, it's all of it until present. You should have it from the moment you're born until present, okay? And these are all points. These are all data points in your life. These are all not necessarily transformative moments, but they are in essence because they tell a story. OK, and this is going to help you. So hopefully right now you have an idea of a couple of things. You have an idea of you how you're going to go get your baseline of who you are today, the brand that you are. It, that was intentional because you didn't intently build it. Um, you're going to have an idea of how to create your story mission, your brand mission. And this is going to help you. This exercise is going to help you build those, uh, you know, the story moments that we're going to create later on with storytelling for your brand. Are we good here? Hopefully we are. Venezuela, yes, Venezuela. Um, sorry, Noel, I am from Venezuela, from Caracas, sorry. So, um, we have a story, but what is storytelling, right? I didn't know that when I came to do this work at Microsoft. I got hired to build stories, create stories for AI and data in core services engineering. I am not an engineer. I wish I was. In fact, I think I'm going to go pivot and be an engineer one day, but not now. Um, I love engineering, but I was, I was, that, my, my background is communications. They were bringing communication um, experts and marketing experts to this area to begin telling really connected stories about AI, data, and the other six functional areas at Microsoft, including security uh, and Power BI and different things. And so for me, it was a very daunting task. I was brought here. I was excited to come. But then I got the job and I was like, oh, crap. What am I going to do next? I don't even know what this job does. And I had to figure it out. And so I went on LinkedIn, by the way, huge plugin. LinkedIn is a very powerful tool, a very powerful networking tool. I went on LinkedIn. I connected with a bunch of people um, and they accepted me. And people at Disney, people at Google, people at Amazon, people at um, uh, Facebook. I connected with people uh, in different industries, the hotel industry, entertainment industry, all of which had a title that said storyteller. I was like, huh, well, that's my job now. And I got to figure out people that have been doing this job, what have they been doing? So I connected with them. And I, and I, once I did, I asked them one question. I said, hey, can I bug you for one minute? I just need to know not what storytelling is, what it's not, right? Because I wanted to, I was curious, I was like, what is not storytelling? These were producers, writers, visual storytellers, um, audio storytellers. These were bloggers. These were influencers. So all these people that had a really good idea about what storytelling was when I didn't, because I just got here. So they gave me this answer. What is not storytelling is all these things. It is not opinions, assertions, facts, data, um, possibilities. It's none of that. It's not marketing. Please don't ever think it's marketing. It is not. It's a way of connecting. Uh, it's not exploitation. Very important key point here. You can manipulate with story. And it's definitely not going on Instagram posting stories like, oh, I'm a storyteller. That's not what it is, right? So if it's not that, what is it? I'm glad you asked. I didn't find a really good definition online when I went out to research and learn about this, educate myself. So I created my own definition, which eventually turned into a book, right? Storytelling is the emotional transfer of all that stuff, of all those opinions, data, assertions, information. And it's done through the introduction of a character and plot and conclusion. Three basic elements of story. In other words, you can say that if you're not having a character, if you don't have a character or a plot and conclusion, if you're missing one of the three, it's not a story. So think about this for a moment. For me, it was very important to, to essentially highlight that it needed to be emotional. And I'm going to plug this in real quick because we've all been exposed to really boring stories. They're stories, but they're boring. They're inconsequential. Nobody cares. The really great stories are emotional. The really great stories make us feel. And I started this conversation saying, your brand is what makes people feel. So this is where it connects, okay? Somebody put in the chat, we're allowed to do so. Don't restrict any, okay, sorry. Um, Questions at the eight. No, please go ahead and put the questions in. I, I did say that we can um, put the questions in the chat. So yes, you are allowed to do so. Just plug them in. I am more than um, more than happy to uh, include your questions as we go in. Okay, so please put them in. So emotional transfer of this is storytelling. But where do we begin? 
what do we get begin? I, I didn't know where to start either, right? So it was new again. So I began with um, design thinking. I was taking the course in my master's uh, at that time, and I didn't know how to do storytelling. I knew now what it was, but not how to begin. And so I actually talked to my professor and I said, hey, can we prototype stories? Can we use this for, like, can I use this for my project? And the professor said, absolutely, you could, you could prototype anything you want. It is a product. You are a product. Your brand is a product, right? The stories are a product. So you can use this model. And so that's exactly what I did. I began to think about how this, the five phases of design thinking plug in so that I could build my stories. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I could build my brand story too, because you can build any story. So this is the what I'm giving you here so that you can actually begin to map out how you're going to build your brand story. Remember, you have a mission. You decided you were going to have a target audience. You're going to serve the world somehow. We haven't figured out yet how. But up until now, you've been building a story that is yours, right? Maybe not intentionally, but things have happened to you in your life. You were born one day. Stuff has happened. Your story has been building up until this point. You can use that to leverage uh, the next chapters of your life and to create the story that will actually be your brand. So what I learned first was that storytelling, design thinking begins with empathy. And that was crazy to me because I also learned at the same time that I am not empathetic by nature. In fact, I took a test. I took a test called, called Clifton Strengths. And I was like, oh man, out of 35 attributes, I was number like 33 on empathy. And I was like, this is, this is not good. How can I do this work? How can I build my brand if I have to be empathetic to my audience, but I'm not necessarily that innately. And I learned that you can actually become an empath. It is a thing. It's a soft skill. So you can actually learn it. So I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not empathetic like me, you can learn to be empathetic. In fact, we're going to do a little practice exercise to be empathetic today. There's actually three levels of empathy. I hope you're ready. You ready? First, we have to understand what empathy is. Empathy is the experience of understanding another person's thought process, lived experience, background, another person's um, thoughts, another person's emotions. It's actually not just putting yourself in someone else's shoes. It's actually walking in their shoes a whole lot, right? So think about your target audience. For me, if I was going to target these younger women in tech, I need to remember what it was to be younger, I wasn't in tech back then. I probably I was because I came in tech. Yeah, I was in tech. But I, I just, I had to really remember what it was, right? How I felt when I was in my early 20s. I was much different. I was now in my 30s. So it was really a different phase in my life. I couldn't target them. I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't appeal to them if I was talking different, if I was dissonant and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't relevant to them. So that's why empathy is important. If you're going to talk to IT pros, your language is going to change than if you talk to women uh, who you know, live in Venezuela, live in the Caribbean. It's a whole different atmosphere and environment depending on where you find yourself. That's why for me it was really important to think, do I want my brand to be global? If I want my brand to be global, I have to neutralize my language. I know and I get that I'm very Americanized right now. So I try to be a lot more neutral in my language because I have now a wider audience. That's why for me, it was important to neutralize my sarcasm, right? When I'm here, of course, my sarcasm never went away. I'm not not sarcastic. I just dial it down in because I want to appeal to my audience. So it's not that you're stopping. You're not going to not be who you are. You're just highlighting the attributes that appeal to your audience consistently. That's not unauthentic. That's just inauthentic. That's just you highlighting the best parts of you so you can show up in a way that captures your audience. I hope that makes sense. So that is empathy in essence. And like I said, there's actually three uh, different levels of empathy that we can be. The first one is cognitive empathy, saying they're human. So right now, all of you listening to me from wherever parts of the world, I practice empathy by thinking, wow, all these people are human. And by that, what I mean by that is just for that reason, I don't even know you, but just for that reason, I can understand that we're all going through something. Our condition, our human condition, allows us to understand that some of us may be sick. Someone we know may be sick. We're dealing with finance issues. We're dealing with educational issues. We're dealing with city or government issues. There's so much happening in the world all the time. So that empathy helps me to not be robotic when I contact people on and offline. That's where the authenticity comes in. Because you can be yourself connecting and reminding yourself that no matter if it's a screen right now, I'm still talking to people, I'm still talking to humans. 
right? And the way we do this, the way we can practice this today is asking ourselves, how's someone with COVID feeling right now? If we pause for a moment and get our side, our own feelings and think, wow, someone with COVID, we may know them. Uh, somebody that we may know um, is dealing with this illness. How are they feeling physically and emotionally? If we don't know them, we probably know somebody who knows them. And so we've been affected globally by this tragedy. It really talks about our interdependencies as humans. We are one. And so empathy helps us understand outside ourselves and get deeper into our, our core humanity. The second is emotional empathy, and it talks about us together. We are human, us being human. Um, I usually said, hi, media. It didn't happen coming from the U.S., targeting people globally. Difference, difference in thinking and cultures created and hindrance in connecting with people emotionally. Oh, sorry, let me reframe that. Didn't happen coming from coming to U.S., targeting people globally, difference in thinkings and cultures created a hindrance in connecting with people emotionally? Absolutely, absolutely. When I came to the U.S., it was a shock. So the question was, uh, he's asking, thanks for asking Ayush, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If not, please let me know how to pronounce it in the chat. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, and it's a constant, it's a constant uh, battle, it's a constant journey in trying to connect with people emotionally um, when, you don't, when you have all these different um, journeys to map out. This is why your story is important. Because for me, once I learned how to connect with my target audience, my target audience, um, that's who I connected with. That's who I targeted. I learned about them. I learned what makes them emotional. My target audience, I learned that they were very insecure. They were coming into the workforce, uh, typically right after college, and they were very insecure. They had imposter syndrome. They didn't know if they belonged. Uh, I think that was the biggest word was insecurity. And so the way that I began to connect with them emotionally was by sharing my own stories of insecurity that I experienced, my own things that I was going through. And they could relate and go, wow, if I'm insecure, she's insecure, everybody's insecure, it's okay, right? And we could talk about it. So this, I'm actually going to talk about this in a minute. That's what I call the universal truth. It's really thinking about um, connecting with people at their level. And I'll show you how, how we do this, uh, but really thinking about um, their emotions. Neil says it affected the human beings, but benefited the nature. So we're talking about COVID. Yeah, I think I think COVID has absolutely, um, you know, made us reflect on many, many things. Our impact to the planet, our impact to each other. Uh, I think it's d definitely helping us reflect on many levels uh, about our humanity and our planet. Noel says imposter syndrome, been hearing about it lately. Can you explain what it is in a few words? Oh, good, Ayush. I'm glad. Yeah, so imposter syndrome is this idea that you are somewhere, but you're feeling insecure that you actually don't have enough knowledge or enough experience, enough background to really be there. So you feel like, you, like, you feel, you feel like you're an imposter. You walk into a room, you're like, man, everybody else around me knows good, knows a lot, and I don't know half what they know, and so um, I don't feel like I belong here. I'm, I'm here by chance. I'm here by... Um, no, by, by um, by luck, um, I'm here, but I don't belong here. And and that's a, that's a lot of people. A lot of people, you know, will feel that. I felt that. I, I feel that all the time. I feel it now. I feel it with my book. You know, like I'm like, I wrote a book and I'm like, oh, will people like it? I don't know. Most, you know, I don't know. And so you, that's this is insecurity. And so a lot of my target audience deals with that a lot. So when I think about us being human, this is how we practice this kind of empathy. Um, thinking about the one person affecting another at the individual level, it affects us all as one. Right. COVID has taught us that COVID, COVID has taught us that, you know, what we do, the actions, uh, it's not the meism. It's if I do something, it immediately will affect my immediate network, my extended network. It can affect the world. And so this this idea that we are all connected is really important when we think we are all human. We are all affected at one point or another. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Newell says. Wow, I can't believe I have experienced this and still do. Yeah, exactly. So we experience this all the time. So this is when you think about your brand. It's really important to think to think how to overcome that. And I'll talk to you guys a little bit about that. The last, the last one is compassion and empathy. I am human. This is when you become vulnerable. When you are willing to go back to that story of origin and you're looking at those data points and going, okay, which stories do I want to share and why? For me, I learned that my audience wanted stories that were connected, that were human, that were a lot about relationships, especially about, you know, romantic relationships. So I opened up about that. I opened up about my 
I had a really terrible luck in high school. I never had any boyfriends. In fact, my only boyfriend was my husband, which I who I married. So not a lot of people liked me when I was in high school. I was a total nerd. And so um, I tell those stories and they connect with me because they're like, oh, well, Miri, you know, if Miri got married, then I probably get married too, right? So it's the idea of relational, um, you know, relevance through your stories. I would have probably not been thinking about those stories, but I put them in my line, like my timeline. And I was like, oh, they'll connect to the story. Oh, they'll connect to the story. So you're able to be vulnerable and pick your humanity and share that humanity. Check in with yourself. Practice this by checking in with yourself and recognizing your own emotions. Those emotions will help you stay human. Those emotions will help you not be robotic when you tell your stories and they will come out authentic. Somebody says here, on the issue of imposter syndrome, what can one do to stay away with, uh, to do away with it? Newell, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And I know we're going to run out of time, so I want to, I want to get through it quickly. But I do want to say it's really important that you understand that not a, what you think people think about you is not true. Um, and, and the other piece is when you target your audience, it doesn't matter the rest of the people, what they think. Once I targeted my audience, the way I've dealt with some imposter syndrome is if I target young women in tech, you know, early in career, if somebody who was not that audience came to me and started telling me things that I should or shouldn't be doing, I don't care because I didn't target them. This is not for them. When I went on LinkedIn and I started talking about my stuff on LinkedIn and I started tar targeting my audience, a lot, I got a lot of hate. A lot of people came to me and they were like, why are you posting this on LinkedIn? This is not Facebook. Ah. And I was like, block, block. You're not my audience, right? And my audience was loving it because it was for them. And so I learned that once you target your audience, your, your focus on laser focus on really branding yourself for them. And it, the rest doesn't matter. That helps you with the imposter syndrome a whole lot. I have a question. Uh, Rachid, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm related to what you're saying right now, but with regards to something you talked about earlier on LinkedIn, how do you balance celebrating your achievements versus people thinking you're showing off or bragging? Yes. I think celebrating your achievements is an important part of your of your brand. hundred um, percent. First of all, people are going are never going to brand you the way you want them to. Not even your mom. No, not nobody who knows you and knows your job is going to go and praise you for what you've done. You are the only person who can. Okay. If they give you a bonus, if they write you up really nicely, nobody sees it on LinkedIn, right? Maybe an endorsement that doesn't matter. So yes, go out, go out and celebrate yourself. Go out and tell people your achievements. How do you do that bragging? You include your target audience in your community. You say, hey, I'm really excited that I got to speak at this event where I was able to share uh, these learnings. And you add learnings and you share the experience. You tell a story and you're telling somebody that you went to this country and talked about this. So you're bragging a little bit of having the opportunity to have that platform. But now you're adding context that goes beyond that one event. And you say, hey, here's my learnings. Hey, here's what I took away from that event. And now you're sharing your learnings and it doesn't show up like you're just saying, hey, I got the keynote at this event. Right. I got an award. Hey, I'm really excited to share with my with everyone uh, that I was recognized for my efforts in doing this. Learning this path taught me blah, 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 blah. I failed three times before I got here. Here's what I learned. So when you attach an, a life lesson, we attach your life story to that. People don't see it um, as bragging. They see it as an achievement, as an extension of your story, which it is. That's why having your origin story is very important. Um, let's see. It's actually a way for people to know her better. For instance, I can't wait to buy her book. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, setting up a niche and focusing on that on social media really helps. Yes. Uh, thank you, Reza, for showing the, uh, my friends Donna's uh, TED talk about overcoming imposter syndrome. I was actually going to mention that. So I hope you understand your understanding. Empathizing is really important. We're going to move quickly. Uh, we're going to design the story. So the way you think about your audience is they have needs. My audience had a need. My audience needs to belong. They were having imposter syndrome. They feel like they don't belong. They feel like they don't have a seat at the table. They feel like they just got there and they don't know what to do next. So for me, the universal truth for them was you belong. You belong. That was where I, bl I blended in. Okay, here's the need. They need to belong. So I'm going to make them feel secure. Hey, I can't move those bullies out. I can't tell them where to go, but they're going to be there still, but you're still here. You belong. You stay. We're going to move the needle together. We're not going to walk away. I almost quit. You don't do, don't quit. We all, if there's more of us on this side, there's going to be less on that on the other side, right? So think about the need of your audience. Think about what emotions they have that they need. If it's an IT pro, 
and they need to do digital transformation. And you have the chops and you are, you know, you're a cloud engineer, you can help them operationalize the cloud. What are they feeling? They're probably feeling, you know, also in security. They're feeling like they don't know how to do the job. How do you talk to them? Do you have content to share with them about things that you're learning from moving to the cloud so they can feel more empowered to do this job? It's all about the needs that people have. In your audience, they're going to have needs. Find out what they are so that you can actually define the next steps. The, la the, the third step is defining. You have your story mission, which I shared earlier. You define your audience. Hopefully you will. You're going to define your character. Who are you in the story? What are you going to go do in the story? For me, I decided to be the Batman to the Robin. I, I'm the Robin to the Batman. I wasn't going to be the Batman. I wasn't going to be the superhero. My girls are the superheroes because once I drop off and I, and I leave, they're going to stay in the industry and their daughters are going to stay in the industry. And we're going to pave out the way for women in tech. We're only 2% right now, less than 2%. So for me, it was empowering them to continue so they can empower others and they can empower their daughters and they can empower their daughters. And that became a mission, a purpose for me. My, it gave, I gave my brand mission. It was no longer about me. My, my personal story, it's not about me. My brand, it's not about me. It's about empowering. And when you look at my content, typically it is to these audiences. You're welcome, of course. Oh, good. So here's what I filled out. I became feminine and kind because my girls, not the world, my girls need reassurance that they belong in order to close the equality gap. You see how that works? That's how it works. I filled out my brand mission. Now I have a mission. I have a mission and I'm going to go do this in the world. And that's what I set out to do. I started this about seven years ago and here I am today. I've been able to reach worldwide audiences. I've been able to mentor many women of all ages, many men also, because once you start your mission, other audiences will come in and you expand your audience, you expand your reach. You may not mean to, but it does. It happens because you're set for a purpose. Okay. And so you begin your story mission with this. It'd be cool if you can blog or make a book on this particular subject. Thank you, Noel. I will absolutely think about that. I know we're running out of time. Let me know on the chat if you want to stay a couple minutes so I can finish up. I know we're running out of time, but I can stay a few minutes. After you create your brand mission, then you're going to create your story mission. My story is dedicated to the story mission is completely different than the brand. You have your brand. Now you're going to do your story. Remember, you have a piece of paper with your entire story. What do you do with that? This is where that goes. My story, my life story is dedicated to that audience that you defined. Get, get deeper. Okay, cool. I'm glad you guys have more time. Get deeper. Who is this audience? Create a persona, create a demographic, create a psychographic. Right now, there's a lot of information on demographics out there, on psychographics. Once you've defined your niche audience, go out and find out who they are. What do they like? What, they, what motivates them? What inspires them? Plug that in there and just indicate that to them. You have a lot of information to share because you're going to learn about this audience, right? Again, you can't target 8 billion people in the world shooting blanks. But if you have a specific audience and you target them, now you know and you learn more about them. So your content becomes intentional. It can help them, in my case, again, as I put here, it can help them when you're feeling secure, reassuring them that they belong and make them feel, as you can see here, reassured, empowered, that they can continue. There's the feeling word. My brand makes people reassured. They feel like they belong. I welcome people. I welcome in, in, young women into tech. I tell my own stories of failures. I, tell, I put myself out there. I talk about my dog. I talk about my husband because I'm reaching an audience, a niche audience, and possibly a bigger audience, right? Um, and I do because I make them feel something. My brand makes them feel something. I hope this is making sense. Then you get to ideation stage, right? You get to brainstorm ideas. Now, this is just one brainstorm piece of um, ideation. I call this scam. This is a, a scamper. It's an acronym. What if you replace a character in your story? What if you modify by the plot? This is a way to actually create layers to that story that you're creating. You're adding different themes, different ways to tell the story. I clearly don't share the same story that I do with my young women, uh, with young men when I mentor them now that I have an extended audience. I clearly don't show the same stories on LinkedIn that I do on Instagram or Twitter. I've learned that each audience has different, obviously different needs. So while my theme is the same and my brand still is the, is the same, I go at it differently because I, I, I think about different layers. That's how you're going to think about your social channels as well, your digital channels. Get, get creative. Think about your story. If you have to, I don't know, if you have to tell me how does your story smell, right? Mine is kind and feminine. I would probably say a flower. I don't know. But think about different creative ways of of, of 
shifting your storyline, how you can say, because this is going to help you pitch your brand, your five minute, five second elevator pitch. What are you about, Miri? I'm feminine and kind. I help people belong. Wait, tell me more. Oh yeah, if you want to learn more, this is what happened to me. I was bullied for by, by Microsoft for a, month, for a year by four women. Whoa, tell me more, right? So now I have a bunch of little stories that I'm pitching out there to make people curious about me. It's not ordinary. It's not extraordinary. It's a terrible story that I was bullied, but I didn't overcome it either. They, they, some of them were still, one of them still there, right? I didn't do anything wonderful. It just happened to me. It's a thing that happened to me that I used and leveraged to talk to the people because it may have happened to them too. And guess what? It was happening to them as well. So think of different ways that you can actually pivot the story. What resources on personal branding would you recommend? Um, hold on one second. Eliminating imposter syndrome is part of your personality development for me. For instance, I have felt the feeling of not belonging and people telling me I don't deserve something. Yep. And as I grew older, I suffered with it, but I got over it once I told myself I deserve everything good in the world and that I belong. That is also when I realized the importance of being kind and welcoming. Thank you, Sam. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, the way that you see yourself, is the way people will eventually see you. Again, branding yourself is your job. You are the CEO of your life, right? And so you get to tell yourself who you are. You don't get to be defined by other people. And that's really important on, on imposter syndrome. We have someone saying, we'll be recording once we have uploaded on YouTube and share the slide shares. No worries. What resources do I recommend on personal branding? Um, I will share those after the talk, um, but there's a lot of books out there. And, and Donna Sakar is really good on, on a TED Talk as well. How to concentrate on studying with laptop online instead of distracting from it. Oh, how to concentrate on studying. Uh, I actually put music, concentration music really helps me that, and I move away any noise, anything that can be distracting. So I center my place in, in this. I, for writing, I need to be always concentrated. So I, li I literally put, plug my headphones in, listen to music. I do a little bit of yoga before and, I, and that helps me concentrate. Okay, we're almost at the end. Creating your story concepts. Once you've defined your story, uh, you can decide how you're going to go out at it. What kind of ways are you going to tell the story? This here are elements of story. You can tell the story in different ways. Uh, the one at the bottom is the Lion King or the hero's journey. Uh, there's one that's very dramatic, the mountain on the top left. There's one that's even more dramatic, the guy little, the guy falling in the middle. Uh, that's called the immediate rest, meaning in the middle of the action. So you can start your story. You can tell stories differently every single time. The idea is that you don't do it at the same time all the time. There's different audiences, there's different channels, uh, there's different ways, there's different stories you're going to tell, all under the same theme. Those attributes will stay the same, but you can craft stories differently and take them on, people on a journey. Make them curious about who you are so people get, get excited to get to know you. And here's uh, how I give you an example of digital channels. So as you can see here in my LinkedIn profile, I share a story about my dog. Why? Because my girls like dogs. They like relationships about dogs. And I don't care if somebody else doesn't because that's not my target audience. In fact, I do get a lot of responses, positive, mo mostly positive responses. So once you target, you know how to, how to contact them. Here's on Twitter. On Twitter, I've been uh, clearly talking more about my book. There's a lot of people um, that, that are there. I started my channels on Twitter, so I'm very avid on Twitter. And so I get a little more sarcastic on Twitter. It's a more American audience for me there that I've been able to build. So you'll see a little bit more of my spunky personality there. On Instagram, most of my audience is on Instagram. Most of my girls that are following me are on Instagram. So I've actually had to create an Instagram account, which I didn't have before because they were there. So as my girls move to Instagram, I move to Instagram too. Find where your audience is and go put your channels there. Don't ask people to come to you. Don't write a blog and say, come find me. No, tell them, you, you go find them. You're targeting them. So create the channels that make sense where your audience is. And then I Google myself. And now I have a Google panel. And now everything about me is there, my Twitter account and everything else. Why? Because I branded myself. I spent over five years doing this work. And now I, when you Google me, you'll find me. You don't just find my address, right? Google yourself. Where are you? If you're not there, then you have a lot of work to do. But eventually, once you start doing it, you'll find digital presence is today's resume. Digital presence is your brand today. People Google you before anything, right? So you have to be really careful on how to do this. So this is it. And then you test it. This is the end. Designing your story, you're going to go test it. Hey, Miri, I learned this. I, you know, I created a story. What do I do? Put it out there. It's a low cost, low effort. Fail fast. Be willing to fail fast. Have thick skin. Put it out there and ask yourself, 
did the story evoke the emotions I wanted? For me, did I make my girls feel like they belong? If that's no, oops, do it again, do it again. And I failed and I tried and I failed and I tried and I failed and I tried. This has been a long haul journey for me in the making. It doesn't happen overnight. But you learn every time how not to do it so you can learn the next time how to do it. If you don't try it, you're not going to do it. So failure doesn't make, failing doesn't make you a failure. It makes you a doer. And if you switch that mindset, you'll be able to put yourself out there. Change something. Test it again. Test it again. Test it again. Test it again. Until it works with your audience. That said, your origin story is your differentiator. What you wrote on that paper today, those points from the moment you were born until today, is going to help you define those key moments that you want to share with your audience. Stories are for your audience. Define that audience. Think about who they are. Be targeted. Not to them. Meaning you're not just going to tell them whatever without thinking about it. You're going to craft the stories. You're going to be intentional. You're going to be empathetic. You're going to be authentic. I did, I did, I did. Get creative in your storytelling. Put your dog out there. Put colors out there. Do videos. Think of anything that you want. Get on TikTok if your audience is on there. Try different methods until you see what works. And finally, do it with heart. That's what's going to differentiate you when you talk with passion. And you're going to be passionate because you're going to have a purpose. If you don't have a purpose, you're not going to be passionate about it. That's it. So I'm going to take questions now. If you want to connect with me, I'm all these channels. I also wrote that book, Brand Storytelling. It helps your personal branding as well. People are asking resources. This is a great resource. This is actually what I gave you is the Cliff's Notes to all of this and more. So if you want to learn more, you can actually do it here. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. First, I'm going to get the questions that are here, and then you can absolutely unmute yourself. So we have friends and fans out there. Great. You're sharing some people. What do you think about having a personal website? Can it be replaced with LinkedIn? Thank you for asking. I just created mine. So I had been doing this without a website for many years, over five years. And I just launched mine like a month ago. I think it's a great idea, but I think it's a good idea after you've created a social presence first. These channels enable you to have a presence where you can connect with people one-on-one -on -one instead of asking people to come to you so you can actually connect with them. And that's a better, uh, a better plan at the beginning as you begin to, to build it. If you already have a good following, make it easier for them and, and create your website. But I think in the beginning, it would be harsh uh, and, and, and not as, as successful to have people come to you instead of you going to them. I'm glad you, you liked the session, that uh, you were able to enjoy it. Let's see a lot of new things. I'm glad you learned. You can always connect with me and ask more questions. Secret to writing effects of social media copy. Um, yeah. So I, I also have some secrets. I'll actually share with you. I'll, I'll do a, a little a snippet on LinkedIn and I'll share with you some secrets. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. There may be cases where one tried the level best to make attractive stories, but people don't appreciate them kind or be, je be jealous or rather make mockery of them. Oh my gosh, yeah. There's going to be a lot of haters out there. You know what I do? I block them and I delete their posts. That's your, po that's your channel. It's your post. I tell people all the time. Sometimes I engage with them and I'm like, Oh, hi, who made you the content police, right? I thought your job was to be an engineer, not a content police. So when people get on there, I kind of switch it on them and I make them look stupid for getting on my content. I didn't ask you to come to my content. This is not for you. You're not my target audience. So you get a little more empowered when you have a target audience and the delete button and the block button are your friends on social media. <laughs> what do you recommend? Uh, have a personal account aside your account oriented to the public. Uh, I hope you mean on LinkedIn, personal account uh, oriented to the public. I think, you know, all your accounts are yours. Um, I, I have my, my, you know, my Instagram account, my Twitter, they're my personal and they're also me. So I, I don't think, I think people might get confused on having two different accounts. Uh, you are you, right? Uh, the Miri at work is the Miri at home. So I don't know profession, the blurred, the lines are blurred right now. And people want to get to know you, all of who you are, the mom, the, the daughter, the sister, the friend, it's all your personal. So it's, it's all personal. I think, I think it, it would service you if you create two accounts and it would, it would actually confuse people. I'm glad you enjoy this. Thank you, Newell. Gracias, Miri, of course. Uh, how to build your social presence when you have an idea but confused where to start and you're scared, confused and insecure. Oh, I'm glad, Newell. Um, yeah, you know, I was insecure. I had no, no idea how to start it. Hopefully this will help you. Once you have your story, you know with where to start. You'll know who to target and you can get creative about where to start. I started sharing my own story of being bullied and that really resonated with more people than I thought. It was very vulnerable. It was very scary. But once you cross that line, it's out there. Like it's just out there. That's it. It's just awareness. And so uh, 
cross over the threshold, what what's the worst that can happen? Somebody doesn't like it, that's okay. They're going to start, keep going, keep going, keep going. People will, will start tuning into your stories. It took me a few, a few years. It didn't happen overnight. So you build your social presence every day, create content at least, you know, I, I post at least three posts uh, per week. Um, I, I have, you know, my content is typically educational. It teaches people something, it has a life lesson or it has some insights that you can't Google. It has my personal lived experiences. It is inspirational. People like to be inspired all the time and it's personal. It's not stuff that I've gone through that nobody else can talk to. So if you can't Google it, it's insightful. Think about how your stories play into your social content. Don't just say, read this article. Well, then I could just follow that article. Um, I can say, I read this article and here's what I thought about it. And now I'm adding my own insights and my personal uh, insights to it. And that's how people like the content. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, social presence, brand storytelling. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Manas for shocked sharing about my, my book about storytelling. I hope you like it. I hope this was inspiring to everyone. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for the session. You're very welcome, Rashid. I hope to see you on Microsoft as well. How much for a copy? Um, so it is, it's, it's, I think it's different pricing. Um, I'm, I'll put it on the chat for everyone to have it. Okay. How do you manage your time to dedicate your work and the time for your personal projects? Oh, I barely sleep. Um, it, I have to have a very tight schedule and I have to be very, um, very, very, very um, structured with my schedule. So that's why I love, I love when I go on vacation because I can just do nothing. Um, but it's hustling, right? We all hustle to do other things. When you do your job, that's, that pays the bills. When you do the extra stuff, that's the hustle. And then you can pivot from that. So your job is not going to get, your job is not, you know, you're going to be dependent on that all the time if that's all you do. So don't give it all you got. Give it enough that you're good at it, but then create your own your own universe. Again, you're the CEO of your life. So hustle it up. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV. That's dead time to me. Become a, cons a producer, not a consumer. The more producing you do, the less time you have to consume other stuff. Do your job and then go do and pivot somewhere else, which is really, really important. Uh, let's see. Oh, you missed the beginning. Well, I'm glad you joined later. Let's say a person is doing, okay, let's say a person is doing multiple creative pursuits and business, and she would definitely miss out on niche targeting and personal branding can go for a toss. What would you advise for such individuals? I, who might, um, I hope I'm saying that right, who might. So yeah, um, you're always going to have a target audience. So whether it's a hybrid audience, um, which has multiple layers, but you still have a target audience because you're not targeting just children or older people. You're you're, you have a target audience. So yes, you may have multiple projects going on, you should have different stories for each of those audiences with the same attributes. So your question really is about creative pursuits. Yeah, um, you have a business, you have your clients, that's, that's an audience. Outside of that, what else do you have in your creative pursuits? So begin to map out those audiences, mind map it, and see whether attributes play in and how they play in. Again, when I talk to IT pros, my persona is a little bit different than it does than it is for young women in tech, right? And it should be, it should be because they like to be they have to have pointed, um, you know, content. They like bullet points. They like to get to the point. And so it's really different than when I approach a very highly emotional uh, young woman in tech. And so that's that's uh, how you target it different. How can we present our work for personal branding online? Uh, get out there. Use Medium. Use um, use LinkedIn. There's a lot of ways that you can actually share that work on LinkedIn. You can cl clip papers. You can highlight content. You can highlight your um, your um, links to other other channels where you have been um, promoted or you have a content that has been featured. There's many channels right now that allow that for you. LinkedIn. Uh, you can highlight things on Instagram. So please use the social media channels. In fact, your social media presence is your resume today. It is your business card. So we are looking at that. When you get hired, we are looking at that. Um, yeah, different channels serve different things. One channel can serve multiple audiences. Absolutely. I mean, you think of LinkedIn, everyone's on LinkedIn. And so I've learned, again, I've grown my audience because even though I was targeting a specific audience, more people tuned in. And so more people started following me. I mean, literally overnight, I started having all these followers, not because I intended it, just because I was targeting an audience and it resonated with them too. I started getting a lot of inbox messages, people saying, hey, Miri, what you said on LinkedIn really resonated with me. I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know it would. I mean, I'm targeting a different audience, but I'm glad it did, right? So yes, you can definitely use, it can serve many purposes, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, you know, and I'm not saying get on all channels, by all means, get on the channels that make sense and that you know your audience is there. 
how do you target the audience for storytelling? Uh, you do it the same way. You think about where you serve best, what your story, how you want your story and your life purpose to serve. You, cho you choose that audience. You say, hey, I really enjoy, my story is about, I don't know, overcoming hunger, right? And so I want to target people that are dealing with that right now in this part of the world. I don't know. My story is one of illness because I'm always sick. I have this chronic illness. I want to talk to people who have chronic illness. Okay, talk to them, right? So you get to decide based on your experience and the talents that you have. You have your story. Your, your story is yours. It's the uniqueness about your story. And so that helps you define your audience. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed it, Roshan. When and where can I find the recording of this webinar? I'd like to share with people. I think we're going to have it on YouTube. If you were to pivot your another career, say software, an engineer, and data science, how would you go about your personal branding? Oh, I love this question. I am actually going to pivot. I think I am uh, because I want to start. I want to start coding. I said I would for 2020 as one of my things, just for fun, and maybe I'll I'll take it up. So, um, how do you pivot? You just you begin to talk about it. Once you you know you say, hey, I'm a storyteller. I'm a storyteller. Getting into getting into code now. Can I get some audience? Can I get some help? Can somebody tell me which coding, you know, uh, academy is better? And people get into it. People talk to you. People are willing to help each other. So you start pivoting and getting on people's minds that, oh, now Miri wants to code. And so now my, I've basically given myself um, awareness, people awareness of my intent to pivot before I even become start pivoting, right? And once I do, I've built my audience and I start talking about it. Hey, I just became an engineer. I went from a storyteller, a communicator to an engineer. Who wants to hire me? Right. And so people, you, you'll know this, people hire people they want to work with and the rest is learned. Right. So if I have the, if I have the basic skill set, I can get a job. People, people may have really good resumes, but if they, if they're suck, if they suck as a person, nobody wants to work with them. Right. So the way you, the way you appear on social, it's alluring to people. If you appear positive, if you, people want to work with you because of that. So once you build your brand, you have more of, more um, of, of an expansion of an idea that people can want to, want to work with you. Uh, let's see. Thanks, Miri. My mind is twirling with ideas. I'm so glad. Go get those ideas done. I'm excited. I hope that you do, Katrina. Uh, can you switch, throw some light on the uh, global internships? Yes. So for global internships, we have decided to go virtual. Um, Kathleen Hogan sent a note earlier this week about that. Um, it's it's going to affect differently to different people, mainly because of the uh, of, of the nuances that occur around legalities, uh, guidelines uh, in different countries. Typically, we have interns come in from all over the world here to Seattle. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Uh, so we will be communicating um, to everyone, uh, especially those who had already uh, been announced that they had their internship, that they were hired, um, how we're going to go about this. We're currently working on this right now. What would you suggest uh, on external branding for an individual? I think that could be helpful for students, for example. You know. Uh, I wear floral shirts. Yeah, so once you define your target audience and you know what they like, what inspires them, then you begin to actually look like what inspires them, right? I mean, you think about people like Steve Jobs. He was always wearing his black shirt, very very chic. Uh, he did that on purpose, right? He branded himself on purpose. It was it was for an, a very highly IT pro audience. So they want simple, they want sleek, they don't want to think about floral. Uh, he knew his audience. For me, it was interesting. I actually went through a lot of phases of wardrobe, of hair, of makeup, because I was finding my niche in what would appeal to my audience. I have to look youthful. I'm 42, right? So if I'm going to target 22, I can't look 42, right? I have to look a little younger than 42 so that I can look relevant to them. So the way that you pivot yourself externally, online, everywhere else really will depend, once again, on your target audience. You appeal to them and you learn because you're going to spend time researching. Uh, let's see. What else? Uh, should the story be written in highly exaggerated language as normal is not appreciated in the market? Hi, Mugha. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Well, the story should be written or told in the best way for your audience. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what your audience is going to be. You do because you're going to define that. I do get exaggerated sometimes because my audience, as I said, is highly emotional. So I like to be emotional. I am emotional and I like to share that so that I can appeal my audience. But if I'm dealing with other people, if I'm at work, for example, if I'm at a board meeting, clearly I dial down on those emotions and I'm more composed because I'm I'm uh, I'm appealing to the audience that's in front of me. So for the typical uh, general sense, you define your audience and you define the language that you're going to use. For me, sarcasm, I had to nix that as part of my language. So I don't talk much more like that to my audience because it's not doesn't appeal to them. So that's also very important. 
Uh, hi, Miri. Thank you for joining. Yes, thank you for joining. <laughs> Let's see. You may know social media. Please connect with me on social media. We have to wrap up, so thank you so much. Um, yeah, what advice will you give your Microsoft internship applicant? Okay, last, last, uh, last question. Advice for Microsoft internships. Again, everything you learned today, I know it's kind of clip notes, use all of this because we are hiring people that we want to connect with at the personal level. We want to know your origin story. We want to know what you bring to the table at Microsoft. We are very interested in bringing diverse talent to Microsoft. And diverse comes from your lived experience. Diverse comes from what we know beyond the resume. There's a lot of qualified candidates, a whole lot of qualified candidates. What makes you stand out from those qualified candidates is not just your schooling or your work experience or the projects and the extracurricular activities. It's truly around how you pivot yourself and how you position yourself in the market based on your personal story. Again, your story doesn't have to be extraordinary. To you it isn't, but to us it is because we don't know it. If you take the time to craft it, if you take the time to target market um, yourself for Microsoft, you learn what Microsoft loves, that could be a target audience, you can appeal to Microsoft because you're positioning yourself for it. That's it. So thank you so much. I know we are out of time. I just wanted to share with you and hopefully this was very helpful to everyone. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording.